Hey, common scientists. This week we're coming to you with the topic of comfortable and being being comfortable, what is comfort? And we're gonna talk a bit about what that means to us, a little bit about what that means in the world of science and research, and then how that can be applied to your life as a common scientist. Now, what is common science being a common scientist? It means that we're coming to the table as commoners. We are not experts. We are doing our best to ask questions about the world related to topics that we're interested in. We all do our own research and come to the table to refine and figure out what the common science of comfort is this week. So we've got myself, Lauren, coming to you guys, Dre and Aiden, you'll hear from them momentarily. But I would love to kick it off with the idea of comfort and what you guys think being comfortable means to you. What being comfortable, everybody's looking at me, it's funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, what, me, what being comfortable means to me, uh, to me, being comfortable means ease. It means, man, it, it's a tough word to, to define uh, because, I mean, it just has so much to it, I think. Uh, but to me... It means a few different things, but it means just being relaxed and and to have uh, kind of all well with the world in mm-hmm. some ways. Uh, but in other ways, we'll have to get into uh, how being comfortable might actually be harmful. So, uh, yeah, that's, I, I suppose, where I would start with comfort. Definitely. And I, I think kind of what you hinted at like research or just like the way that we think of comfort today is definitely changing it seems like or maybe because of our age we're coming of age and realizing well comfort that comfort means something different so as a kid comfort was kind of what I wanted right um I think all at least mammals seek it I know that Lou my wife's dog seeks it all the time and I get frustrated with him because he's like He'll go from, he won't ever, like, hardly ever, like, lay on the wooden floor. He's like, no, I'm way too plush for that. Like, I'm way too bougie, can't do it. So then he'll hop on the couch, and I'm like, all right, like, I don't really want pets in my furniture but it is what it is but then there'll be like blankets and pillows on the couch and then he needs to like lay on top. Like he needs to be like the comfiest <laughs> of comfort comfortable and it's just like dang like and it's like really i bring him up a decent amount on a podcast because it's really like a clinic just to sit and watch him and then try to like self or psychoanalyze my own behaviors and my own desires and i definitely see where like he definitely points a finger back at me where i'm like I don't want to be that. I don't want to be like him, just constantly seeking comfort, constantly seeking like the next nap and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, but as a kid, that was definitely the goal, right? The goal is to live comfortably. Like that was kind of mm-hmm. a thing people say, well, yeah, you're either well off or you're living comfortably, comfortably. And that was definitely the goal. And it wasn't until you get a little bit older when you realize, no, it's like everything that you want, you're going to have to work your ass off for it. And it's going to be a lot of pain on the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I commonly think in theme songs, which is like just a Lauren thing, there's always like a song. And when I when I asked the question and then Aiden started thinking or answering the question, what was going on in my head was that song that's popular today. It's like feeling good like I should or whatever it is. Like that's what I think of when I think about being mm, comfortable, like vibing, yeah. feeling good. Like you should. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Um, and that kind of mantra, carefree, feeling carefree. Uh, I think less of R and R type napping comfortable, and I don't really think about like laying down. But I think of vibing, feeling good, not working hard, ease. Yeah, those are some of the things that I think of. So the ideology of the wor- word, uh, if you just look it up, is a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint which i thought was fascinating freedom from pain as if being being free of pain means freedom i thought that was a weird implication yeah that is that is a fascinating implication something that i had been thinking about a little bit in anticipation of this cast and then also from what dre you were bringing up uh, as a kid having this idea of comfort as the goal uh and then 
even in the definition it sounds like oh yeah what's wrong with comfort freedom from pain right Mm -hmm. who doesn't want that and one common picture that i think especially in the u.s but i think it's true in most places is that there's such a goal to well the the classic like white picket fence kind of example of there's this goal to have this home uh from a male perspective a wife uh male straight perspective a wife and 2.5 kids in suburbia and to have everything figured out in quotes uh like this is what's generally portrayed as comfortable and the goal uh so it's just kind of something that i was thinking about uh and it's funny lauren you bring up the definition itself uh i kind of see it in the in the definition itself like we've kind of elevated comfort as the as the goal in a lot of ways and the freedom bit i think is so could lead people astray so easily because i think yeah it implies freedom from pain or constraint and i think often our comfortable lives is what traps us i mean totally gets us stuck in whether it's that hundreds of thousand dollar mortgage you're trying to pay off to have that white picket comfortable fence and then yeah you end up being trapped in your comfortable life uh and yeah it's such a fascinating concept so where did some of your other research take you guys so most of my research was um definitely built around the comfort crisis by uh michael easter aiden was yours as well or Mm -hmm. much of it how about you lauren um i focused some on that more more broadly as an idea okay. though stay kind of away from his stuff because i knew you guys yeah, really yeah. Get into it some. definitely appreciate you doing that for yeah. us <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so the comfort crisis by michael easter is a book that came out within the last year or so and um i listened to i didn't read the book but i read about it i listened to him on a couple different podcasts listened to a couple hours worth of him talk about essentially what the book's about and his philosophy etc and what he's trying to give to the world and the way he explained it or summed it up uh, a number of times was humanity is more comfortable but less happy and le- less healthy than ever before and that's pretty much his purpose for writing this book that's why he called it the comfort crisis there is something as we sort of alluded to a little bit there's something about seeking out this comfort the comfort not discomfort but this comfort um the comfort being the goal that is making us less happy and less healthy today yeah uh yeah and so i also didn't read the book but i also listened to a few of the podcasts and uh just kind of i mean did a little bit of research outside of that obviously through the lens uh of this com this comfort crisis that he uh, portrays in his, I mean, in his interviews about the book and then uh, in his book. But yeah, just the association between this pursuit of comfort and a lot of unhappiness today. Uh, And uh, one piece that really stood out to me uh, that I've, I mean, found incredibly true throughout my own life uh, is that to grow and to become a better person, got to get a little uncomfortable. You got to, tr- like, trying something new in and of itself is in- in- uncomfortable because it's unknown and all these things. Um, so it was just, yeah, I, that was one piece that really stuck out to me in terms of my own life. Like, yeah whenever i have had my most rewarding moments like starting this podcast it Mm -hmm. it, it involves a lot of trial and error and a lot of uh, listening back to your audio and and saying to yourself wow i sounded like crap Um, (laughs) but but developing over time and and becoming a much better speaker and 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 thinker and all the things um yeah so that progress that's like one example but uh that's where 
where he, his conversation resonated with me a lot is that, I mean, it's just wild that the average person today doesn't need to get uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, I was going to say something about, about the natural <laughs> pain and growth, but then that last yeah. part also is leading me to a different aspect of what he talked about in his book. But I'm going to stay with the kind of the intu- – we definitely have an intuition for growth is painful – that's why when you're younger they call it growing pains right and then I, mm-hmm. I, i'm sure you heard about this maybe you heard about it too lauren but i, I remember in high school kids used to always talk about like osgood slaughter um did you have you heard wait, about wait, that wait, what osgood slaughter i never know how to pronounce it yeah me neither but that's something like that <laughs> something with, there's a lot yeah. of sounds and a slur or whatever yeah, it is yeah. but so it was like this knee pain that people, it's a real thing people get it but like everybody just had it when we were in high school yeah. and i was just like i don't know and it seemed i don't even know really exactly what it is but it's a, it is a pain in your knee and to me it was always associated with growth with like mm-hmm. how like growth spurts that's how we associated with it as kids. Yeah. Whether it is in definition, I'm not sure, but I just remember every yeah. kid after they hit a growth spurt or was like trying to be like a good athlete, they would like talk about it. Like shin splints to, or shin something. Splints, I think, yeah. They, yeah, I'd have to look it up as well. But so. yeah, so this was the whole thing. So that yeah. it was like the fact that physically growing was actually painful for young boys. I know we talked about that a lot. We talked about back pains. We talked about like nipple pains. <laughs> did, did you have those? <laughs> when, like, when you got I the puberty, your nipples not- I have nipple pains. <laughs> oh, I definitely How have that nipple pains. You? <laughs> painful. Painful. Yeah. Yeah. Every time you like, I put on a shirt, it would be like rubbing against it and be like super sensitive. Do you I feel like a better person it. because of it? Um, I feel like a more mature person because of it. <laughs> <laughs> because I went through that pain. Oh my gosh. So yeah, Osgood, Osgood Schlatter. Uh, it's an injury to the knee caused by overuse. More common in men. Um, and it says it results from physical activity during a period of rapid growth. So you were, I mean, you mm-hmm. hit the nail on the head. You're exactly right. This is from butterbraces.com. They're clearly uh, <laughs> <laughs> motivated to make people think that they might have this so they can sell their braces. But yeah. Well, they got us. Thing. They got yeah. all of my old job, All my friends, they got all of us. <laughs> we were drinking the Kool-Aid there. <laughs> That's, That's so true, though. Growing pains. Uh, for me, while I was growing up, I experienced it with, um, like, electrical, I don't know, wiring in your body. So as you grow, this is what I was told, like, as you grow, they're, they're, your body's just figuring out what to do with the, the space. And I would experience these intense moments where, like, I took a deep breath and then all of a sudden there was pain in my chest. Did you guys ever feel that? Maybe Sounds unfamiliar. Female thing. Uh, maybe a female thing. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. And yeah, and then I couldn't take a deep breath for like maybe a couple of minutes. And my mom would be like, oh, it's just growing pains. I'm like, or I'm having a heart attack, mom, but it's fine. Right. <laughs> One like, of those yeah. two. Yeah. So that was my only experience really with quote unquote growing pains. But yeah. Um, I mean, I guess a female thing that I would think would be like. <laughs> becoming more becoming a woman in that process too Mm, how how is that as far as growing pains go it might have been more social but yeah well yeah so there were for sure social growing pains but more physiologically as a breast is developing there's definitely an experience of pain I wonder probably the testicles have a similar phenomena (laughs) where as they're developing there's a period of time where they're more sensitive where you're just starting to experience that sensitivity. But for sure, in breast development, that was a thing, growing Dang. pains, where as your boobs start to grow, like going up and down stairs hurts. Mm. And you realize, I realized I was a runner and a volleyball athlete. And so I was like, oh man, I got I need to wear two bras. Like the least movement possible, the more comfortable I am. Yeah. So I never even thought about that in my research. But yeah, mm. growing pains, staying comfortable, it's wild. That's funny. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's also illuminating for many men to, to, to hear that because, yeah, I mean, it's not something that uh, someone might think of if that's not their, their daily experience. Uh, but, yeah, I think... Oh, and then it's hypersexualized, and then, I oh, mean, yeah. for me, I got bigger boobs earlier on, and then I was 
wanting to wear two sports bras to protect myself because it was uncomfortable and painful. And then people were like, oh, she's trying to wear two sports bras to have bigger boobs. I'm like, actually, I just want to pack them down even more. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just this whole social weird weirdness. Yeah. yeah, man. Middle school and high school was just a jungle. Kids are vicious. <laughs> not, not, are. not counting the... Um, I mean, just obviously the physiological changes we were going through then. Uh, but it's kind of... I mean, for me, looking back on it, uh, it's, I mean, all those things had to happen for us to become who we are today, which is pretty freaking cool. We had to grow through the pain and and then uh, become better people because of it. Mm -hmm. When When have you found yourself most uncomfortable or or just uncomfortable in general and grown because of it? Mm, yeah most uncomfortable uh, I've definitely had like some big moments in sports yeah. <clears throat> like basketball taking big shots etc also like big projects in college uh, public speaking I did like some mm. poetry and stuff in front of crowds um, definitely then were some of the most uncomfortable moments and then now just recently as you two know I completed my 100 day exercise challenge and there's definitely a lot of mental torment with that just not wanting to be at the gym but forced myself to go and sitting there for like an hour on my phone until I'm so sick of myself I forced myself to work out and then there's obviously the actual tearing and ripping and then eventual strengthening of the muscles and just the hours and hours putting in the gym which is I understand why a lot of people don't go through it and never fulfill their exercise or health goals because there's definitely a period before it becomes routine and just a lifestyle where it's really, really uncomfortable and the results are not there. <laughs> you know, it yeah. took, took me quite a bit of time, probably about two months, 70 days or so to really see any sort of results that I felt were worth the effort. Um, but yeah, so that, that was definitely uncomfortable for a while. Yeah, I wow. think that is super honorable and like, yeah, I salute you. You Appreciate are. You. You are <laughs> we, were, we were talking about this the other day. Um, the saying i think science there's also science to support that you become most like the five people you spend the most time with Mm -hmm. and we've been podcasting together and so dre you're definitely in our top five and i was reflecting on who my top five are i was like man i'm glad dre is in there because at least least someone's pulling over to the good side Uh, oh man too much no no like i mean to work through discomfort to get to a goal uh, and to get far enough through the discomfort where you start seeing progress is a point I don't think many people even reach. And I think physical progress is hard because you might start to feel stronger by day 30 a mm-hmm. little and a little more empowered, but you might not see results, like you said, until day 60 or 70 or even a couple of months, depending on where your body's at before you start. Yeah. So uh, super honorable. I think... I have experienced discomfort primarily physio- or, uh, psychologically first and foremost before feeling a lot of physical discomfort in my dad's deployment to Iraq uh, early on mm-hmm. and my parents having a lot of financial strife throughout their uh, marriage while they were still married. and. Um, I think I'm stronger because of it. I think I have a deep empathy for the world and people around me because of it. And I, Aiden calls me a skateboarder because I think that more than some people, I don't know, and always better than the day before, I think that I am good at like standing back up after getting knocked down because of it. Yeah, uh, I think that's super true. Uh, one thing I think that com- one one experience that is incredibly uncomfortable is failing, <laughs> yeah. and and admitting to oneself that like yeah I've, I've failed or whatever it is, um, or yeah I screwed up or whatever it is, uh, or some yeah whatever it might be. But like I think having that experience early 
is super helpful to navigating the world today because I think one thing that was brought up to bring it back to the comfort crisis by uh, Michael Easter uh, is that he talks, uh, uh, he touches on a number of different uh, phenomena that are associated with this comfort crisis. But one of which he talks about was how kidnapping media in the nineties, uh, like led to this kind of helicopter parent phenomena. And then he, he came up with a new term that I had not heard yet. <laughs> snow plow parenting where, uh, the parent attempts to push all of the challenge and obstacles out of parents or out of the children's way. And I've observed that phenomena as well. Uh, and I've honestly experienced a, a decent amount of that phenomena and it, it didn't take me until like for me, I feel like I'm getting almost like a later start in life because I ended up having to learn how to fail like in college. And then after that, especially after that. So I think because you were kept comfortable because I was kept comfortable, mm-hmm. quite comfortable growing up. Uh, so I think, I think that's just a fascinating phenomena that I don't know if yeah, Dre you ever experienced or, you know, other people who experienced or like how that might've played into, I feel like you're somebody who really is willing to embrace discomfort despite all of, like you said, (laughs) the pain that comes with it. Yeah. uh, A couple of things. Number one, that is definitely a huge deal. A ton of, kids entering the world and not having faced that much discomfort, that much pain, that much strife, challenge. Um, And that's a huge part of what Michael Easter talks about in his book, of course. Um, But like you said, I've seen it too. Um, I've experienced it to some degree. And it's it's a really hard thing to do. And we've been talking about it in one of our former podcasts a little bit when I was talking about when we talked about like how your paradigm gets shattered when you become an adult. Mm-hmm. A lot of times that's happened. It seems like that has happened a lot for millennials. All these things we are promised about the world, and then we get here and it's like, oh wait, no, like this is not how it works really. Yeah. And um, it's really doggy dog out here. And so I think that's a that's definitely a big issue. And it's probably. It's obviously not the kid's fault, um, it's, and it's not necessarily the parent's fault either. Like it is, but who doesn't? Like it's the same thing as uh, we we've all grown up here. Like, oh, I want to give my kids a better life. Yeah. Well, it's like well, a lot of us got really good lives, you know. Right. Like they succeeded, but then you know, but then somehow they screwed us at the same time. And it's just like, yeah. dang, it's really tough. And this is this idea that I'm about to say has come up a couple of times with the, with mm-hmm. what you guys have said. Mm-hmm. But a really really important thing about discomfort and pain and challenge is that a lot of times, what's a really good pain or discomfort is one that is kind of like self induced or like mm-hmm. controlled. Mm-hmm. Right. Like there's not a real existential failure that can happen or like right. a real long lasting damaging effect. Sure. It's like it's in some sort of controlled manner. For example, if you're a really well off family, you have a kid. Don't just spoil them rotten. Right. It's like you right. could get that for them. But it's like, what are they doing to earn that? Um, or what are they doing to lose that privilege? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so like like you were saying, I do a lot of self-induced discomfort, self-induced pain. And that a lot of that has actually come from, it is kind of just always been a part of my personality, but a lot of it comes from, I have a very like low threshold for pain I, or toler- um, tolerance, I should, I should say. And I'm very sensitive to it and I hate pain. Like if it's a physical yeah. pain, like, oh, I've tried to, oh, I've tried to like stray away from it, avoid it at all costs. I hate it so much. <laughs> so as I've gotten like, even as a kid, it frustrated me that I was kind of soft, right? And then, but then as I got older, I was just like, all right, like other people can do this, like you can do it. And yeah. one thing that actually taught me a valuable lesson is I grew up Acadian spicy food. And the biggest reason was obviously because it's spicy, it burns, but that spice also led me to believe that it didn't really taste that good. Mm. So I was also just like, I tasted some things and I was like, well, this just kind of tastes like hot. It just tastes like spicy. Like, why the heck do I want this? 
But now, um, since my marriage, M cooks spicy food, and the spicy foods, well, it's really good for you, and it's good for vegans, um, just, you know, spice things up. Right. So I've gotten used to it over the last couple of years, and now it doesn't burn so bad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, like, this is something that right. used to be super uncomfortable, burn the crap out of me. I used to always try to, like, big man, because, like, in my community growing up, my family, they all love spicy food. And they'd be like, oh, we'll, we'll eat the jalapenos right out the jar. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, me, me too. <laughs> you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't like mature enough to be like, nah, guys, I just don't prefer that. <laughs> you know, I was like, nah, I had to be a manly man. And I can remember so many times where I was just sweating, dripping, like <gasps> just trying to keep it all in and just being like super quiet for like 20 minutes. Like <laughs> pretending like everything is okay. Not, uh, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> I didn't have to do that. But now I can see I got used to it. That's something, a pain that I endured. And now I actually enjoy. And that has also happened on my fitness journey. Mm -hmm. We're on a little writing journey, 100 day writing journey right now, which is kind of painful <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mentally. Oh, <that's laughs> and painful. I'm sure at the end of 100 days, it will yeah. be less so and we'll be better for it. Yeah. yeah. For our listeners, uh, when did we start it? Like about 15 days ago 15 mm -hmm. days ago yeah. uh where we're trying to each we have each have our own kind of variation on it where we're each trying to write uh Same. for me it's 20 minutes daily which doesn't sound like a lot <laughs> saying it out loud uh, but, but, <laughs> but when like i'm God. trying to when i'm trying to yeah get drag myself to the computer and get to it because it's something that i like would really like to do and i've I mean, thinking about the long-term payoff, definitely would like to do. It's just, yeah, humans are, humans are lazy and like comfort inherently, I think. And, 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 and I just need, and it's just getting over that hurdle. Um, but yeah, uh, so it's just, it's really funny to me. Uh, yeah. How, how difficult just sitting down for 20 minutes and clacking away on my keyboard can yeah can feel psychologically at least uh yeah <laughs> yeah why why is it that we strive to be comfortable well i think a big part of it is evolution and evolutionary our bodies our dna is wired to want to protect us and to want to survive and thrive and live on and I I didn't focus so much on what you guys had read, but my understanding too was that he talked some about this evolutionary piece of mm -hmm. us, I mean, evolving out of a hunter-gatherer phase where we needed to, I mean, do massive amounts of hard, uncomfortable, painful uh, work or travel or hunting or whatever it was and we live in a world where that's not prominent anymore we don't have to go out and drag a bear with five guys that you just tracked for weeks or you know whatever it is and so by removing this evolutionary toil our physiology our bodies our minds don't have something to kind of like balance out i've also heard that as an argument for why we might be seeing more um like psychological disorders uh that like our bodies don't even know what to do with this without this like pressure i don't know if you guys can expand on it more but that was my understanding of some of the argument yeah no i think you're spot on from everything that um i've theorized or researched for sure there's the evolutionary processes and discomfort for example <clears throat> boredom is a type of discomfort mm. and he actually Easter talked about this. He talked about when you're picking, say you're picking strawberries and you start picking all the, like all the ones in the first row or whatever you want to call it are gone. And now you start digging in deeper and deeper for more and more. And there's less and less. He, he said that he posited that that boredom and that discomfort is actually telling you to stop doing that because the payoff is not as good. So it's like, no, you can better spend your time doing other things. So he's, he claims that evolutionarily um, discomfort or no yeah discomfort was telling you to stop doing something because back then there was so much discomfort that yeah. it's just like yeah like those are things you need to avoid whereas you point out today we do not have as much so now it's actually comfort we have so much comfort at least in mm -hmm. America in general um, western world we have so much comfort that that is actually what's going to destroy us yeah yeah 
So I listened to a TED Talk by Bill Ekstrom, and I think it's apt to plug this now because it was titled, Why Comfort Will Ruin Your Life. Okay. And hmm. I think quite similar to what you guys read, uh, talking about just the need for growth, and that growth comes out of discomfort. And uh, in his theory, he says there are four rings of comfort. And... Um, if you are not watching our live video, which we are doing for the first time uh, on YouTube, check it out. Uh, put your hand on your forehead and then take your hand off of your forehead so that your palm is facing you and put your thumb in so you have a four, right? Um, and so your pinky is the bottom, that's stagnation. That's like having a government job, uh, just showing up, putting in your nine to five. Hey, I wanna just to give the government a little bit, little bit of credit. This is his example though. Oh, it was like, his example? Yeah, this is what he said. Okay. Um, he, I mean, yeah, he just said slow moving, not a lot of growth. I'm not saying everyone in the government is. Obviously people are doing great things, but this, <laughs> this, is, this is from Bill Ekstrom, so that would be the lowest uh, ring of comfort he said then you move one up and that's order um, like achieving a good knowledge of what will happen in your environment right so that's your ring finger then he moves one up and he says now you've achieved complexity which is where sustained or exponential growth occurs and then finally up at your pointer finger you would have chaos which would be like a natural disaster or I mean famine um, and so through these four rings of comfort, he explains there is an ideal place to be where you can have sustained growth, and that would be complexity, that like third level up. Uh, and I thought his his theory was quite apt, and he gave the example of calling his daughter's tennis coach and saying like, hey, I'm wondering when the last time my daughter was in the ring of complexity. Uh, and the coach knew him and knew some of this theory, and. Um, said like when was the last time she really reached complexity and the coach was like you know actually we reached it yesterday we were in practice and she got to the point of tears but let me tell you like I pushed her way harder this week before we got to that point um than last week and like she lasted way longer this week and he was like awesome growth is happening and he said as a parent it was hard for him to make that transition because he knew he was wired to find comfort for his daughter and now mm -hmm. he's like, man, I, I still have to focus. I have to put that, that hat of, of growth on and say, like, man, I'm so happy that that coach pushed my daughter to tears and <laughs> then worked with her to get through that point and to grow through that point. And he was like, yeah, man, before this life crisis that he had that helped him discover this, I think he was fired from some big job. Uh, he said I, I, he didn't realize that stagnation was happening or that he had gotten just to order knowing his environment and not really pushing for growth and um, he explained that there are then complexity triggers like things that can put you into this state of growth and I thought it was a phenomenal uh, theory and a way of looking at things and a great reminder for myself that I you, I can trigger complexity in my life I can trigger myself to grow like you do in the gym Dre and that I can also help friends uh, trigger complexity in their lives in a way that they can grow by helping like challenge people around me anyways it was a fantastic TED talk I would recommend it favorite quote before I stop talking about this long <laughs> explanation but he said it's not the complexity triggering people or events that you should fear the most that would be like getting fired or something it's not the complexity you should fear the most but it's your own willingness to accept or seek discomfort mm -hmm. that will dictate the growth of not just you, but of our entire world. Uh, and I thought that was an extremely apt quote. Yeah. Because I think it's true, like if we keep seeking comfort, our world won't grow uh, and we won't grow anyways. Yeah, two things on that note. I think of the movie Wally, -E, where <laughs> all of the, all of the, all of humans have done so well and robots are helping them all out so they don't have to do any work and so they all have these comfortable automated chairs and they're all extraordinarily overweight and yeah just they can they have a tv screen right in front of that glued to their faces and and so that's one piece of when you talk about the world 
uh, is that, yeah, embracing discomfort is a critical message to get out in my eyes because uh, I think it was uh, mentioned by Michael Easter too about obesity that uh, I think 70% of people are obese or that was what it was projected to be uh, in 2035 by the CDC. One of those two, we'll have to fact check, but as a common scientist, do your research and, and you can verify. Either way, obesity is a problem in, in the US uh, especially. And I think a lot of that comes from this seek of comfort, especially when it comes to seeking food pleasures. And I find it myself uh, working from home, especially when the fridge is only a, a, a two rooms, one room over from from my desk uh is is when i get bored trying to alleviate that discomfort and and get some uh food pleasure in my, in my system oh, uh, your reward system that's I mean, yeah it's so tuned so for those of you who are unfamiliar i mean your brain has a whole area that we call the rewards center that is wired triggered to release endorphins and release chemicals throughout your whole body that give off um i think as much pleasure as you can have when when having an orgasm like this crazy amount of pleasure in your brain can be released and slightly different mechanisms depending on what you're ingesting or what you're doing but we are wired to want to find food and to enjoy eating right and so if you have salt or fats or sugars uh, or sex or I mean there's lots of things that just our our reward center in your brain just goes off lights up and so when Aiden's talking about man yeah you're bored and you're wanting to seek alleviation of course your brain's like oh why don't you hunter and gather over to the fridge and see if you can, get, <laughs> <laughs> you can like, find a I don't know <laughs> yeah the crazy thing is, is it's so far removed from it hunter gathering like it's so crazy in the in the west where if I have my phone, I can with, I don't know, maybe two or three clicks, order on an app and have food delivered to my house. Within like 30 minutes. Like obviously that's like, that is a privileged position to be in. Right. Uh, and not everybody can do that. But a, lot, a, a good chunk of people can. And that is a crazy, crazy phenomenon. Like that, it, t- it takes me... I'm trying to think. If I went into the Chipotle app, it's maybe three clicks if I ordered the same thing I ordered last time of my finger. Right. And mm-hmm. and, and then I can go and pick it up or whatever. Uh, but that that's bonkers to me. I had a friend, uh, uh, Tom Felton, so I'll have to send him this episode and give him a shout out. He's, he's uh, looking fit now, but in college, the Domino's app was doing it taking a bit of a toll i think he said he after deleting the app so he lived in this college house maybe a block away from domino's pizza it's dangerous it's so dangerous and he had the app downloaded on his phone and (laughs) he after deleting the app i think he lost 20 or 30 pounds man you just exploited his deepest secret on common science oh yeah yeah he's he might be heated slightly, <laughs> but then he also appreciate the, 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 the shout lesson. out. Yeah. He's an awesome dude. He's super fit. And I mean, he's learned and, and developed and he's an awesome, uh, genetic counselor, which is a nice segue. Uh, so, um, yeah, all being that all human beings, uh, are 99.9% identical, uh, in their genetic makeup. Uh, so what's wild to me, Lauren, is you're talking about that telling yourself, I can do this, I can get over this discomfort. I mean, to think that I'm 99% identical to whoever it might be, Muhammad Gandhi, like Michael Jordan. I mean, it's bonkers to hear, okay, Michael Easter, this lanky, lanky white western writer goes out into the arctic and is uh hunting caribou for the 33 days uh was what he talked about too in in his interview and yeah i mean it's just bonkers to me uh and that fact so i gotta also acknowledge uh 
the song DNA by Kendrick Lamar. Um, because yeah, that's, I mean, that's just where that, that message came from, for for myself too, uh, was just, yeah, like how identical we are and how much is in our DNA. Yeah, I agree. That definitely is a great way to look at it. I mean, you did it in a little bit more of a robust scientific way, but I think, you know, it's just the classic quote. It's just like anything you can do, I can do, or, you know, it's just, that's a classic motivation specifically, I think in the athletic world, but yeah. anything where you're competitive or you're self-assertive or whatever, it's just like, why would you ever look at somebody else and say like, I can't do that? Obviously there's a spectrum of talents and mm-hmm. blessing gifts that people are born sure. with, but in general, it's like, yeah, you know, that's why it's, it's really frustrating when people are like, I'm big on fasting and people will be like, oh, like I could never fast for three days. I'm like, well, I, like so many of our ancestors did not with it, that like, attitude on a weekly, <laughs> but yeah, not with that attitude. But yeah. it's like, it's such a part of human DNA. Yeah. It's yeah. like, no, you, you actually, you probably should fast for three days. Actually, if you've been eating every day of your life, science says maybe you should do that, yeah. you know, yeah. especially if you're one of the 70% overweight or if you're one of the 2.2% people who take the stairs. Or sorry, one of the ninety-eight percent of people who always take the stairs instead of the escalator. If you were one of the eighty percent of take people, the escalator instead of the stairs. Not one of the ninety-eight percent of people who take the escalator instead of the stairs. Correct. Yes. Okay. If you're one of those ninety-eight percent, which you probably are, yeah, <laughs> maybe statistically, right? Michael Easter also drops that only twenty percent of eating is driven by hunger. Eighty percent of eating is driven by idleness, time, and stress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ninety five percent of time is spent indoors. So he drops a couple of kind of shocking um, yeah. stats in yeah. his book, and I'm guilty of a lot of those too. So yeah. we're we're all not we're not all not innocent or anything else. But uh, I think yeah, going back to the one about eating, you said twenty percent only eat when they're hungry, and eighty percent eat out of boredom or something else. Correct. Wild. Think, yeah. So one thing that I had heard growing up. Um, my mom, I think, explained this, and I'm sure she heard it somewhere, Uh was that uh, now, as soon as anyone feels, or this is common, I think, in especially United States or Western culture, as soon as you feel a little hungry, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm hungry, I need to eat. Uh, However, if you went back a couple hundred years, like evolutionarily, if you started to feel some hunger, that might be a signal like, oh, I should start looking for food. Mm, I should maybe yeah. go out and plan a hunting trip. I should, whatever it is. And so the idea of enduring some amount of hunger for a period of time would actually make a ton of sense outside of fasting. Um, because I think, what is it? You can live with two weeks without food I think and it's, three days without water. I think it's 30, 30 days without food. Well, there isn't really but, a number. Yeah, I mean, there's it people who have done people and year-long fast. Or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, but whatever it is. <laughs> More than a couple hours. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. More than a day. <laughs> right. Whatever it is to say to yourself, like, and I've gotten better at this and my mom kind of said this to us growing up we'd be like mom i'm so hungry and she's like well lunchtime is at noon uh that's like you know three Mm. hours from now and we're like mom i'm so hungry and she's like ah you're probably hungry at a level three out of ten and by lunch you'll be hungry at a level seven out of ten and then you'll appreciate lunch way more (laughs) like it's true and having that mentality so now sometimes as i've gotten better at eating the caloric amount that I need, which is like only a thousand calories a day. If I'm not doing any physical exertion as a female, who's only like five, six or whatever. And it varies. You'll have to, you guys will have to ask your doctor, whoever do your research as a common scientist. But as I've gotten better at maintaining that consistently and when a period of time where I was eating less than I was, my stomach had to do some shrinking. Right. And so I had to tell myself like, my body was like, oh, I'm hungry. I got to go get something. I'm like, actually, I'm not that hungry. It's like a level three out of 10. And there are people in the world and in history who have been much more hungry than I am right now. Do you get what I'm saying? No, I 100% agree. I think hunger is like the number one discomfort we need to start dealing with specifically in America. Like we need to figure out how to be more hungry. Yeah. Um, And be okay with that discomfort. Because being a little hungry isn't that painful until maybe like day two, day three, or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, for the most part. For sure. And I think yeah. So just right off with what you're saying, we talked about in a recent podcast, we talked about um 
evolution and how, or no, it was in our humanist podcast. Mm -hmm. We talked about how one of the main things that made us who we are today. And one of the biggest things was fire and cooking and extricating Mm -hmm. more nutrients Mm -hmm. and therefore spending less time digesting food. Mm -hmm. And we still have obviously that technology. We have way greater technology now, but since we're eating so often, now we're spending just as much time, if not more, this is just my, uh, I'm just guessing the time period, but we're spending Mm -hmm. a ton of time digesting now and that's taking up so much of our like metabolic rate and like our uh, energy because like i think your um digestive system can take anywhere from like 20 to like 45 percent of your energy so if you're eating constantly or three times a day and snacking then you're constantly digesting whereas all that energy could be going to weigh other things like healing your body healing the element healing scar tissue um going straight to your brain so that you can you have more mental clarity et cetera mm. et cetera um, so I think that's a really, really big point of why, yeah, don't just be uncomfortable, just be uncomfortable. It's like, no, historically humans have dealt with a lot of discomfort and that's how our body knows how to engage with the world and, mm-hmm. and function. Yeah. Super fascinating. Totally. I want to look into that more. The idea that yeah. I might be wasting energy on eating. This is like a, yeah. it's kind of a mind bender. I'm it's like, oh man. Right. It's idea. a little counterintuitive. One concept I want to bring up that we definitely have danced around and you, you ta- you actually nailed it. You just didn't say the name of it. So when you were talking about how we used to have all this discomfort and now we kind of don't really know what to do with ourselves. And mm-hmm. that's where a lot of these, um, psychological issues and all that type of stuff is coming from. So Michael Easter in his book, or at least in his interviews, I surmise it's in his book, he brings up a concept, concept called prevalence induced concept change. And then he kind of renames it problem creep. So when a problem, and then he kind of goes on. Prevalence says, induced. Concept change. Okay. So a couple ideas that will help us kind of wrap our heads around this is like when a problem is removed, we find new ones, right? Yeah. Um, there's also this kind of idea of like a knight without a dragon to slay where it's like we're all looking for this big monster, this big boogeyman. So when it's gone, like what is the knight going to do? He's just going to look for a different dragon, a smaller dragon, something yeah. that's not a problem, right? And then so I went beyond the book and beyond Michael Easter and I looked into this prevalence and news concept change. And I just want to read a little bit of this from an, um, the abstract of it's called prevalence induced concept change in human judgment is the article. And it's by Lavari et al. And this kind of explains it. And this concept is kind of even if we kind of can feel something or kind of see something going on. To actually have a name for it and fully understand it can change, just to be educated on it. I've always felt that my yeah. life it can change so much of how we view and engage with a phenomenon that we experience as human beings. It also beings. helps you communicate it with other people. Too. Yeah, it's true. If you're Very having accurate. a conversation, yeah, it makes it a lot easier to yeah, just get to the point. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So they say, LaVar et al. says, Why do some social problems seem so intractable? In a series of experiments, we show that people often respond to decreases in the prevalence of a stimulus by expanding their concept of it. When blue dots became rare, participants began to see purple dots as blue. When threatening faces became rare, participants began to see neutral faces as threatening. And when unethical requests became rare, participants began to see innocuous requests as unethical. This prevalence-induced concept change occurred even when participants were forewarned about it, and even when they were instructed and paid to resist it. Social problems may seem intractable in part because reductions in their prevalence lead people to see more of them. Fascinating. Wild. That resonates a lot uh, personally, and also I think back to I think my freshman or sophomore year of college and an expert from Mayo Clinic came to the University of Minnesota Rochester to give a guest lecture on uh, prevalence of like psychiatric disorders Um, and she explained that much of what she did was train people's psychology to think differently uh, because she said we are biologically wired to this state of distress because the more simulations, negative simulations you could run in your head, the more you might be prepared for danger. 
well, this doesn't apply so much in our world today, at least in the Western world especially. And so she explained that much of what she did was really work with her patients and people to rewire their like neurophysiology or their, the way that they think yeah. to not allow themselves to revert to this state of, of uh, negativity and rumination. So what you just said, I mean, resonated a lot and brought that up in my mind because I think you're so right. We invent pain. We invent the boogeyman. We invent fear, I think, Mm -hmm. when we aren't consciously being focused on like choosing joy or choosing to have a good day or choosing to be excited about discomfort because you're growing. And it's so hard to do. And it takes a lot of practice. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Man. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, from an individual level up to a societal level, I think there's so much there in that concept. Uh, from an individual level, I mean, yeah, we live in, obviously there are a lot of problems out there, climate change, like prison system, all these things. The list does go on and on. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of problems out there. But like from an individual level, like getting into these negative pattern thoughts, like they are patterns of thought where I'm seeing like problems with my own life and like more of those, uh, like in training myself out of those, I think has been super huge. Cause I think, uh, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, we also live in just a completely miraculous time. Like I think about, like what I said about being able to order food in a couple of clicks of a button, being able to, uh, yeah, get outside and enjoy a park. Uh, there's a lot more green space than there used to be. Like the from an environmental perspective, there has been a, a lot, a lot of progress. Like there was obviously the DEET situation where uh, like eagles were on the brink of extinction and and this chemical that was being used uh we stopped using it and and there was a lot of a rebound and there was a lot more pollution out there i mean from an environmental perspective uh obviously there's still progress to be made but it's yeah it sometimes takes a moment to like step back and also like from a personal level like okay yeah i'm i'm starting a phd program in the fall which is super exciting and just like taking a step back from those kinds of negative thoughts and reminding like myself uh and it about like a lot of the positives that have happened and that do happen on a daily basis is is super helpful or i've found super helpful Yeah, and I think leaning into discomfort and knowing that you're growing and pushing yourself into discomfort for those reasons and acknowledging those those pieces of life also are super helpful. It's obviously way easier said than done, and I'm a complainer many days also. I try not to be, but it's, yeah, it's tough. It's a rewiring. But to say to myself, I am uncomfortable now. I am doing a lot of failure now because I don't know what I want to do and maybe I don't have a job maybe I'm figuring out where I want to go with my life but to know that I am set up right now best for growth because I'm uncomfortable because I don't know because I'm not stagnant uh and reminding myself I think of that will be and has been helpful there are a lot of days that that's way easier said than done oh yeah because we're all human. It's like, it's human to, to think in these ways. Um, but like we talked about, I, I can't remember which episode it was. It might've been the humanness episode. Uh, when we talked a little bit about our, uh, brain make, how our brain is made up and how we kind of at the core of our brain, we have this like reptile portion. That's all driven to, to eat and probably to ruminate and all these things um but to have take the second to like kind of over override whatever Mm -hmm. these earlier cognitions or thoughts um are uh by like using our our like executive cortex uh i think makes just makes a lot of sense and it does take a lot of practice to start to 
to learn that. Yeah, and I think um, thinking about the er phenomena, I, I think it's something I heard somewhere, but where you want better, faster, stronger, more comfortable, being cognizant of that and knowing that uh, when people are marketing about making your life more comfortable, they are going for the most primal part of your brain, right? Because everything in you is wired to ease discomfort. And so yeah. I think recognizing that and on researching for this podcast even, man, it made me want to do my best not to be a victim of that marketing, not to be a victim oh, yeah. of buying the more expensive... Sleep number bed. Sleep number bed. <laughs> the, I mean, staying at the comfort in plus plus mega hotel, whatever it is. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't yeah. want to buy into this world that if I'm more comfortable, I'll be happy. Yeah. Because it's so, and that it it's seems necessarily to be so false. Or that if I'm more yeah. comfortable, I'll reach my goals. That's right. just so, uh, yeah. ra- so That's false. That's fascinating that you bring up the, yeah, the marketing around it. It's really funny when it comes to, yeah, hotels and like Airbnb has treated me awesome. Mm-hmm. Also mm-hmm. just camping and getting outside. Uh, yeah, we've been backpacking uh, and it is not comfortable always, but great oh. exercise and like doing th- something like that instead of going to the comfort. And maybe it's not for everyone, but I'm saying for me, man, tough physiological experience, pretty what? uncomfortable. My hips were talking to me and my knees, but it was so good. So growth filled. Yeah. So real in nature. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I wonder too. So with that's obviously exercise with any sort of exercise um i wonder if the reason why we get like endorphin rushes and stuff is just simply your body telling you like to do more of this because historically that's how we would eat like you could not survive without doing that now you can survive without it but there's yeah. still that you know evolutionary thing the dopamine or the uh, endorphins rush that's like no you need to do more of this so um, yeah, and that, I like that you just straight up and you're just like, hey, being more comfortable for a lot of Westerners is not going to make you happy because at the end of the day, that's what matters. If, it, if we were all like super comfortable and super happy, then it wouldn't really matter. We'd be, okay, just mm-hmm. keep being more comfortable. Right. But there is definitely a limit. Like there is too much of a good thing. Our, you know, the history of our psychology and DNA doesn't know what to do with the world that's this plush for so many of us Mm -hmm. and that's why you do see like I think a lot of us if you travel through like the mission work or anything you'll see people with pretty much nothing Mm -hmm. or so nothing compared to us Americans and they're just like they're pretty content and I think there is some skewing of that where it's like "Mm, I don't know like I think sometimes we kind of romanticize that a little bit too much but there also is some truth to that and I think it's because a lot of what we're saying here is that these people some of these people they have like a very known and a very evolutionarily proven like enemy and goal right like they know like right. i'm hungry like oh i need shelter it's like very straightforward yeah. and we talked about this in the are we animal podcast about like losing purpose because the world is our oyster we can do whatever we want mm-hmm. and there isn't any enemy necessarily right? right it's just like there isn't hunger there isn't we are sheltered mm-hmm. we are this we are this but there's no ostracization ostr- ostracization right. for us right we're all good so now we're looking for it constantly and that's why we're kind of a neurological because mm-hmm. we're looking for this thing that doesn't exist yeah and then that's how you can get people like easter brings up the people the bhutanese people in bhutan mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where it's like not a very wealthy nation 2.2 billion gpa or gdp which is like yeah not, you know not, one yeah. person has that you yeah. know and it's just like but they have focused on a simpler life and focused on being happy mm-hmm. and some of that happiness does come from discomfort yeah and i want to give a super a really tangible example because i think this is so important and if our meta philosophical conversation isn't breaking down for you as a listener i want to give you a really tangible example lots of people in the united states and maybe one of you can look up a stat on this while i'm explaining struggle to sleep well um, or struggle to sleep there are whole clinics devoted to it at um, like mayo clinic and other places Uh, it's become a whole profession lots of people struggle to sleep i've been one of them and i think that um the comfort marketing world will have you believe that if you get a better pillow um, or a more comfortable bed or you buy the plush 
I mean, pillow topper, or you have the therapeutic whatever where your kid can jump and your wine glass stays. I mean, sure, all yeah. of this marketing will tell us if we, if we get that, we will sleep better. But you know what science will tell you? If you lean into some discomfort in your life and you turn off the TV and have an uncomfortable conversation with your wife an hour before bed and find a little bit of uh, real life interaction, that'll actually help you sleep. Or if you lean into the uncomfortable idea about going for like a three mile walk in the late afternoon and then turning screens off, man, that might be uncomfortable for you, but you'll probably sleep better. I mean, yeah. that's a really tangible example where there is science to back up these these things that would feel potentially uncomfortable that will actually solve your problem or answer mm-hmm. your, your problem when marketing would have us believe. But if you just get that bed, you know? Yeah. And so I think uh, just a tangible example There's for something lot, yeah, I think many people identify. For sure yeah. is just, yeah, turning off the screens because the screens are, are what, I mean, just gets your brain uh like going uh so one thing that i'll do is either read a book or Mm -hmm. uh play a board game do a puzzle something that yeah involves more human to human interaction Mm -hmm. um or intellectual development uh yeah and also helps me sleep better so Mm -hmm. uh, to me it sounds like a win-win-win definitely no it definitely is it's just you you need that impetus that first push and lauren for what it's worth a quick google search said 70 million so about 20 percent of americans have chronic sleep issues wow so yeah and and interesting obviously obviously there's some people who have like have conditions that would inhibit their sleep but i think a good chunk of those would would probably be rectified there was a i'm trying to remember the name of the show i'd have to look it up but it was like a it was a popular science popular medicine show and this sleep expert doctor guy meets with this teen girl who can't sleep Mm -hmm. and he's like well how about you put away your phone an hour before bed you hop in a warm bath an hour before bed you drink a warm glass of milk and have like a little snack and her sleep problems like it had been plaguing her for years and then all of a sudden she was able to sleep like a baby Mm -hmm. and it was just like wow all these things that don't cost necessarily cost you money and time besides for maybe the warm milk and the and the the snack before bed uh did extraordinary things for her uh yeah yeah sleep and then i mean consequently her physical health and mental well-being yeah, we've talked but, to you a lot about, I mean, being uncomfortable physically and a little bit socially, but some of my research also brought me to, and probably because Google knows me and knows that I'm a woman, but seven ways to avoid getting too comfortable in your relationship. Mm. Uh, that was another piece that came up, and I, through this research, and I, I know we're about time, but, and I want to let you guys comment on this too, but through my research, it really reminded me, and I hope I remember this cast moving forward I'll have to listen back to it I do not want to live a comfortable life especially if it's costing my growth and especially if it's costing the world growth and I hope that as a common scientist and as a listener you guys can think about what this mantra means for you and we're not saying everyone has to go fast or I mean start sleeping on the floor or whatever it is but uh, (laughs) Dre might Dre Dre thinks everybody should go fast I think like just thinking about this I certainly do not want to live a a comfortable life if I'm sacrificing my growth and my happiness I do not and I hope you guys will keep me accountable to this 50 years from now and help me me and stay on track to living a meaningful life a happy life a growth filled life yeah I'm with that (laughs) Dre you have any any comments or Uh, questions or concerns yeah one just about the relationship piece i think that's awesome that's one of the kind of rare ones where we hear a saying or a cliche like don't like you've gotten too comfortable in the relationship and you just kind of let things go so that's one of the ways where we do hear comfort being a bad thing and i think that can relate to a lot of different other aspects of our life that we don't necessarily even if we kind of know we don't actually put into action and do anything about it so like you said obviously going back to the ted talk it's complex right humans are complex discomfort is good comfort is good too much of either is a bad thing Mm -hmm. right yeah finding a balance is super important uh i have this 
quote uh, that is by Seneca, who is a, a, a Stoic, um, and Stoicism is quite, a, a lot of it is based into this, around this idea of embracing discomfort. And his quote goes, I judge you unfortunate because you have never lived through misfortune. Mm-hmm. You have passed through life without an oppo- opponent. No one can ever uh, know what you are capable of, not even you. And boy, I mean, that just <laughs> applies incredibly to our, our conversation. I think about Dre, the concept that you talked about, about um, what was that called again when it came to <laughs> speaking of prevalence induced concept change prevalence induced concept change i think about that in terms of people uh i've noticed a lot of people myself included uh inventing inventing a lot of enemies or or problems uh and i think in in the west those who are privileged enough um and have a lot of these resources tend to invent kind of a boogeyman, whether it be, I mean, obviously there's still problems out there, but like whether it be the 1% or immigrants or whatever it might be, a Mm -hmm. lot of people are inventing these opponents because they don't truly have opponents besides themselves. Like in my eyes, those who have a lot of the basic needs um, met and can meet them without much discomfort. Mm-hmm. Like the opponent should be oneself and is oneself. It, it's how can I be better like this next year as opposed to last year? How can I help the world be a better place? Yeah. Like in, in yeah, going forward. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Aiden, because I think. For any listeners, if you're if you hear this and you're challenged, and I certainly was in this conversation challenged, I think that asking yourself maybe where you are too comfortable in your life, and how you could share some of your comfort, because there are areas of the world that could use help and support and comfort in a way that we now are kind of abusing right like if it's starting to affect our happiness and so i can't uh i can't emphasize enough the importance i think of of traveling and of asking questions of other getting outside areas in the world getting outside getting outside getting into nature um yeah to share to share your privilege uh if this cast kind of challenged that aspect of your life but man common scientists i want to thank you for tuning in this this week this cast and for asking yourself a challenging question with us about comfort and about what and how in your life might be too comfortable and where you're missing out on some growth and i think as common scientists the best you can do then is get out and experiment a little and ask yourself yeah where can i induce some discomfort so that I and the world can grow. Hey, Common Scientists. Hope you enjoyed the cast. Thanks for investing in Common Science. We hope it brought as much value to you as it did to us. To learn more, smash the subscribe button and visit our website, commonscientists.com, where you can read our blog, join our email newsletter, and follow us on social media. Finally, if you like what we have to say, you can absolutely support us on Patreon. We can always use more support. You can navigate there also from our website, commonscientists.com, common scientists with an S, so that we can continue cultivating a community of common scientists.